Uh, my first remark should be explain something about the schedule. That is that Sam Totten, a good friend for many years, uh, was engaged in smuggling food into the Nuba Mountains. Uh, he's an activist as well as a scholar uh, as I am. And uh, he was taking a shower and he collapsed uh, from dizziness because of his anti-malarial uh, medicine and injured his back at the same time. So he was not able to be here. He regrets that very much. I'd also say, by the way, that uh, when I was five years old, my mother told me what my name meant. My name is John, not Jonathan, but John, and it means gift of God. So that has been a kind of a burden that I've had to carry all my life, that in fact my name means that I am a gift of God. So let me uh, point that out, and you can take your program and scratch out the uh at the end of it. Okay. Uh, this is a shortened paper. When I read it to myself last night, finally, for the first time, it ended up being far too long. So I've indicated to the translator where I have omitted those parts. And uh, perhaps if the proceedings are published, you'll be able to see the entire paper. And the paper offers a framework for advancing our understanding of questions pertaining to the memory of Srebrenica. It is informed by the study of the Holocaust as well as other examples of atrocity crimes and the confrontation with their memory. How has the legacy of Srebrenica contributed to the formation of national, religious, and political identities in a world that recognizes individuals' multiple identities and the changing nature of the ranking of those identities in individuals' lives? According to Jamal Sokolovic, organizer of a number of international conferences on Bosnian politics and sociology since 1995, victimization, such as that in Srebrenica and also in Bosnia as a whole, can crystallize identities. Let me take a glass of water here. <clears throat> And then I have a, a long quotation from um, Sokolovich's work, which I will omit um, as well. Let's see if I can get it. Okay. But there's other evidence that suggests that the explicit targeting of Muslims and mixed ethnicity people during the conflict increased conscious identification with the targeted group. In 1996, a student refugee from Bosnia was present at Cornell University at a discussion of Bernard-Henri Lévy's film, Bosna. She concluded her remarks by stating that one of the things she resented most about the Serb attacks was that, although she was a daughter of a Muslim father and a Serb mother, the siege of Bosnian cities was forcing her to choose a single identity, which she refused to do. Peter Novick's study of the role of memory of the Holocaust explains the role of Holocaust remembrance in the period between the 1970s and the 1990s by focusing on the Jews who chose to express their commonality with Holocaust victims for somewhat different reasons than did uh, Yasmina Bertsovic. He asks, what does differentiate American Jews from other Americans? On what grounds can a distinctive Jewish identity in the United States be based? These days, American Jews can't define their Jewishness on the basis of distinctly Jewish religious beliefs, since most don't have much in the way of distinctly Jewish religious beliefs. This is Novik talking. This is his interpretation. They can't define it by distinctly Jewish cultural traits, since most don't have any of these either. American Jews are sometimes said to be united by their Zionism, but if so, it is of a thin and abstract variety. Most have never visited Israel, most contribute little to and know less about that country. In any case, in recent years, Israeli policies have outraged the secular and the religious, hawks and doves, a less, satisfactory, uh, less than satisfactory foundation for unity. What American Jews do have in common is the knowledge that but for their parents, or more often grandparents' immigration, they would have shared the fate of European Jewry. With an increasingly diverse and divided American Jewry, this became the historical foundation of that endlessly repeated but empirically dubious slogan, we are one. Novik is making a rather synchronic statement here, however. 
He seems to assume that some future set of events could never bring Americans who self-identify as Jews to sincerely embrace Jewish religious beliefs or Jewish cultural practices with renewed fervor. Studies of Nazi-created Jewish ghettos indicate that secular Jews, such as those expelled from Germany to Poland, who found themselves in the ghetto, often rediscovered Jewish culture and Jewish religious practices. The resumption or intensification of Muslim cultural and religious practices and its concomitant moving up of Muslim in individuals' hierarchy of identities has been well documented by observers of life in Bosnia during the 1992 to 95 period. I did myself. An important question about which I have not been able to locate polling data is whether this had any effect on the additional identification of individuals as Bosnians, Bosanci, or as ex-Yugoslavs. Past studies of the politics of memory suggest attention to certain important distinctions. Types of memory, ranked according to their creator's capacity to engage counterarguments or other intellectual challenges. <clears throat> Number one, scholarly memory, what Henri Rousseau calls la mémoire savante. This work is produced by professional historians and social scientists who usually possess some commitment to the ideal of scientific objectivity as well as training in archival techniques, documentary analysis, and intensive interviewing. Number two, official memory, produced by governments and courts in documents, commemorative rituals, and monuments. Number three, popular memory, produced by a variety of vectors, from semi-officials such as textbooks and hudbe, to journalism, fiction, songs, and probably the most powerful channels and repositories of all, films and videos. Number four, which I've given the title to, family memory. Transmitted and nurtured in local settings such as kitchens, weddings, bars, barracks, town squares, musical performances, and sports events. These places are the most frequent, but certainly not the only place, where traumas resulting from past loss and injury are acted out where minority counter-memories often claim space against dominant public memories, and where taboo and officially repressed but in effect unchallenged memories can dwell as ghosts in the attic. This paper argues that the memory of Srebrenica will not become a source of enlightenment, warning, and perhaps even inspiration until these types of memory these four practices of recollection and storytelling have publicly met fought, tested each other, and negotiated an uncomfortable but nevertheless workable and comprehensive peace agreement. One result of repressing such public contestation, I would argue, is the Bosnian genocide itself. The popular memories of the battles of World War II that set partisan against Chetnik or White Guard, Ustasha against Jew or Serb, Hanjar against Chetnik or Jew, and Yugoslavs against Russians were not allowed expression in the public sphere. The nationalist card could not be played. The remembered grievance could not be examined in a court of public opinion or scholarship. The ghosts remained in the back room, growing prosperous and immune from challenges to their evidence or accusations of distortion, falsification, exaggeration, imbalance. When Milosevic began his post-1988 Greater Serbia campaign to be accompanied by Tuđman's own nationalist ventures, the ghosts came from the back room into the street, cheering on the gangs, the militias, and the newly purged Bosnian Serb army. So there's contested terrain. La mémoire savante confronts the Yugoslav controversies. La mémoire savante, scholarly memory, would not begin until 1997 to make its contribution to the understanding of the atrocities at Srebrenica and the events that led up to them. The initiator of this sustained, ambitious, financially demanding, emotionally challenging, sometimes heroic international project, Charles Ingrao, professor of history at Purdue University, describes its origins. The Scholars Initiative, capital S, capital I, that's what he used, 
began modestly enough in 1997 when our colleague Dusan Batakovic expressed an interest in beginning a dialogue between Serbian and Western historians to help rebuild professional relationships that have been destroyed by the recent wars of the Yugoslav succession. He says that the propriety of national, the proprietary national narratives that have emerged have created or intensified tensions between nations and ethnic groups through the insertion of myths and the exclusion of inconvenient facts. So long as politicians retain a de facto monopoly over public memory, perception, and interpretation, they will continue to discredit and marginalize the few independent voices that challenge them. Indeed, there exist many among the region's political and media elite who privately concede the corruption of their vocal minorities, uh, majorities, historical accounts, but who nevertheless lack the courage to challenge them. Since the turn of the 21st century, then, this extraordinary attempt at a comprehensive but perforce never complete intellectual peace agreement among the representatives of the different national, ethnic, and political loyalties inhabiting the intellectual world of the Balkans has consumed the energies of 12 teams of 20-odd professors, each from all the countries of the Balkans, especially former Yugoslavia, as well as the United States, the United Kingdom, and at least 20 other countries. For our present purposes, however, the important question is the degree to which the reconstructive historiography of the scholars has enlightened the producers and consumers of the other types of memory mentioned above. In the opening phases of the enterprise, senior editor Ingrau made clear the high standard required to be considered capable of contributing to la mémoire savante, of participating in the, in the exercise. As a scholar's initiative, we have admitted virtually none of the many accomplished Western investigative journalists who have published significant accounts. Given the greater overlap between the two professions with some of the successor states, we have permitted the participation of some journalists from the region who hold advanced academic degrees or university faculty positions. We have also welcomed the heads of research institutes and repositories who in some cases do not have a doctorate in history, law, or social science. So there are limitations on the, team, on the teams. Professor Ingrau has informed me, however, that they expect that a highest ranking state official will publicly endorse the scholars' initiative within the next few months of 2015. The next topic is a project interrupted, the Razbiachi Duhova, a sustained and well-supported attempt to study the formation of official, semi-official, popular, and family memories of the Bosnian disaster has remained on this historian's agenda. After delivering aid items to Bihać and Tuzla in July 1995 as the courier of a small Save Bosnia group in Ithaca, New York, I returned in 1996 to begin an annual two-week teaching stint at Tuzla University Summer University. For the first years, my courses dealt solely with a previous specialty, the history of technology. But in 1998, I introduced a course entitled Ghosts and Legacies, How Nations Deal with Guilty and Divisive Pasts. Professional literature concerning the Holocaust had a prominent place. At the end of the course in the summer of 2000, the students from the three major Bosnian ethnic groups and from Banja Luka, Sarajevo, and Derventa, as well as Tuzla, expressed an eagerness to bring the questions and theoretical issues produced by the research on France, Germany, and America, and Japan to bear upon the Bosnian case. On 18 January 2001, I thus arrived in Tuzla to begin an intensive week-long seminar with summer students and new recruits. We drew largely upon resources available at Tuzla or at Cornell, but uh, in one three-hour long seminar, it was, it was conducted by speakerphone with wartime editor of Oslobodzenje, uh, Kemal Kursbahic. We planned a series of meetings open to anyone that would coordinate an international research and training project intended to institutionalize in Bosnia and Herzegovina the relatively new historical discipline variously described as the study of the formation of historical consciousness or the construction of public memory. Our ultimate objective was to instill in Bosnian teachers, students, and citizens a critical awareness of how their past was conveyed to them 
An understanding of how such public memory was constructed, framed, and conveyed would allow them to limit the impact of conflictual or threat-creating narratives and to identify better the agents shaping their thoughts and actions. We insisted then that the ghosts of past conflicts and political crimes must be called down from the attic. That is, the back spaces of kitchens and bars and films and other locations of popular and family history to be interrogated in a continual process of analysis and interpretation. We were convinced of the destructive influence of these unchallenged myths on past politics. At the suggestion of one of its members, alluding to a popular movie of the time, the group took the name Ghostbusters, Razbiachi, Duhova. Uh, so we then were confident that the technique of ghost busting, that is of understanding the languages in which statements about the past, especially the conflictual past, are expressed, could be treated as a separate subject from the reconstruction of the past, a search for a commonly accepted, judiciously documented truth. We hope to in fact, sustain a common enterprise that deployed a critical analysis of the language of public memory the functioning of the vectors that can face statements in that language, such as textbooks, films, songs, and monuments, and the ways one could assess their importance and influence. For example, I want to give you some examples. Within the Ghostbusters, we were training at the end of 2001, where a Serb from Banja Luka who was studying the representations of the destruction of the Verhaden Mosque in Banja Luka and statements made about the significance of attempting to rebuild it. A Bosniak Croat team who were studying the conditions of production and the changing attendance at the two contrasting memorials built at Amitsi after the ethnic cleansing in the Lashva Valley and a number of other studies. The analysis of themes in and production and reception of films about the 1992 to 95 disaster made by Bosnians, Serbians, and foreigners proved a promising line of research and the final paper will give examples of some of the ways we looked at the films that were produced and looked at the context uh, in which the films were made, the sort of interaction between context and uh, text itself. That project uh, remains to be completed. The Ghostbusters uh, continue to have ambitions that they will do this, and they will continue. In March of 2004, however, after this project was interrupted by questions of financing and of health, uh, in March 2004, I learned of the bombings and militia raids by which the Bashir regime in Khartoum had been attempting for a year to radically diminish the non-Arab peoples of Darfur. And since that time, only one trip to Bosnia in 2011 has distracted me from spending the time not teaching and committee work to writing advocacy and actions connected with the genocide in Sudan. But the ghosts of Bosnia's memory continue to haunt me, and the Ghostbusters continue to deserve support. I welcome the chance provided by the Institute for the Islamic Tradition of Bosniaks to return to the fight. The, uh, the, the prominent University of Chicago historian Peter Novick has remained a productive source of questions that can guide such an inquiry, however. The focus of his curiosity is a strange increase in the prominence of the Holocaust in American life in the period since the 1970s. His expectation was that concern with a phenomenon that ended in 1945 would be strong and active soon after the event, then gradually weaken in the following generation. According to Novick, this didn't happen. The explanation for the unexpected timeline of the Holocaust lay in two points of concern, two needs of American Jews, and to a somewhat lesser extent, non-Jews, protection and moral clarity as expressed in simplified propositions. In the matter of protection, American Jews had previously contrasted their secure situation in the United States with the precariousness of Jews abroad who faced hostility from their own governments or peoples a uh, hostility that seemed to increase with every Israeli victory in the Middle East, be it in the Six-Day War of 1967 or the Yom Kippur War of 1973, now seemed more vulnerable. Speak, leaders spoke about a new anti-Semitism in America that interwove in ways not entirely clear with a new enthusiasm for the Palestinian cause. After all, the 1973 war had been a much more close-run thing than was the one in 1967. According to Novik, Jews turned inward defending their own interests rather than building bridges to the non-Jewish world. Since the Six-Day War, it seems, American Jews had come to view themselves as an endangered species. 
Will this same feeling of threat cause Bosnians, especially Bosniaks, to give Srebrenica, already a symbol of extreme victimization, a more prominent place in their mental desktop? It seems uncertain, especially while Karadzic and Mladic were at large and permitted to be at large by NATO occupying forces, the perception of threat seemed to be in no way paranoid. It was real. On the other hand, the recent growth in European anti-Muslim political parties and talk of the weakening of the secularist traditions of Turkey under the Ottomanist or simply Islamic gestures of President Erdogan might, but only just conceivably, cause more Muslims to turn their gaze to the rows of crescent mark graves and to those now visible criminals on trial who did the most to put the graves there. Moral clarity was a second explanation for Novik. An issue, media portrayals of the Srebrenica massacre presented a picture not so different from that of iconic portrayals of the Holocaust. Virtually helpless victims, murdered men, women deprived forever of husbands and sons, or permanently diminished survivors. Escapees from a site no less deadly than the killing ravine of Babi Yar or Building 11 in Auschwitz. Absolute depraved indifference on the part of the bystander international community Loyalty to the institutional interests and bureaucratic mechanisms of the United Nations on the part of Yasusi Akashi and Kofi Annan that trumped feelings of human solidarity. Cowardly cooperation with the murderers on the part of Dutch bat troops who, it turned out, claimed to detest their Muslim charges more than they did the Serb attackers. Novik seems to be suggesting then that the Bosnian cause appealed to Americans because it could be fitted into a Holocaust template that framed pure evil attacking pure innocence. The intellectual arena in which Holocaust references and Holocaust imagery were deployed offered a still point in a morally turning world, an image increasingly compelling as the 1970s brought Watergate, the soul searching after Vietnam, the vision of the 1980s me generation, and the massacres of Palestinians in the Sabra and Shatila camps as Israel invaded Lebanon. Certain American Jews initially had no hesitation in calling for action. Speaking at the opening of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the executive director of the American Jewish Congress, a Holocaust survivor, said that uh, ceremonies would be empty gestures if America did not act decisively to aid Bosnia. Not to act is to say that we have learned nothing from the Holocaust. When the responsible parties in the Clinton administration, who had let Holocaust analogies provide the background music for their advocacy of lift and strike policies during the campaign, days of 1992 confronted the realities of the Bosnian battlefield, however, the Holocaust template began to seem more like a Procrustean bed. The reach for moral clarity resulted in a destructive use of things like moral equivalence. Uh, what was involved there, this is quoting Novik, what was involved there, uh, Clinton's Secretary of State Warren Christopher told a congressional committee was a morass of deep distrust and ancient hatreds. There were atrocities on all sides, classic example of moral equivalence used. As a toxin to assemble and stir up the righteous then, never again retains power, perhaps even more power than it had before the 1970s. But as an analytic framework or policy guide, it has to be judged often misleading and occasionally dangerous.